Hi Grade 12s, I'm going to be doing this lesson on the fertilizer industry, the last chapter in your textbook. Most of your teachers have made it a self-study chapter. It is very important um, for your exam though because the mark allocation is normally between 9 and 16 marks out of 150. I have drawn this lesson up according to the guidelines so you need to know everything that I'm going to go through in this lesson. Your organic fertilizers are manure and compost. The positives for using organic fertilizers, manure and compost, is they are more environmentally friendly, eco-friendly. The negatives, they are labor intensive, the nutrients and their ratios are unknown. Farmers also do not know how much of these fertilizers are absorbed by the plants. The non-mineral nutrients are carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, which the plants get from water and carbon dioxide in the air. Mineral nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. These are absorbed by roots from the soil. As mentioned from the previous note, the non-mineral nutrients are from water and air and there we have carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And the mineral nutrients which are absorbed by the roots from the soil, the primary nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, just remember NPK. And then the secondary nutrients are calcium, magnesium and sulfur. We are not going to have to learn anything about these three, but we need to know quite a bit about nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. When we look at a sketch of a little plant, I have the flowers, the stems and leaves and the roots below the surface of the soil. If you go in the order is N, P, K. N, nitrogen, is the leaf and stem maker. P, phosphorus, is your root maker. And K is your flower and fruit maker. So if a farmer wants to farm with spinach, he needs strong leaves and stems, so the nitrogen content needs to be high in the fertilizer. A potato or sweet potato or carrot farmer would need to have a high content of phosphorus because those are actually roots, they're below the surface of the ground. And for fruits and flowers, fruits, good fruits come from good flowers, there the potassium content needs to be high in the, in the fertilizer for the plants. The soil has been depleted of these mineral nutrients, therefore they have to be replaced artificially or supplemented artificially. So when a bag of fertilizer is bought, you will see a ratio on the bag, a number in brackets and the actual mass of the bag. The ratio is the order nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK. So three of nine parts is your nitrogen, one of nine parts is phosphorus and five of nine parts is potassium. Three plus one plus five is nine. The 25 in brackets means that 25%, 25% of your 50 kilogram bag is fertilizer. The remaining 75% in the bag is fillers, for example, sand and limestone. This is a typical type of question from this chapter. Calculate the mass of each primary nutrient as indicated on the bag. So we need to calculate the mass of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in this bag. The bag is 50 kilograms. The nutrients are in the ratio 3 to 1 to 5. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and 25% of the 50 kilogram bag is fertilizer. In the first step, we are going to calculate the total mass of fertilizer in the bag. The total mass of fertilizer is 25% of 50 kilograms. That works out to 12,5 kilograms. So the total mass of fertilizer in this 50 kilogram bag is only 12,5 kilograms of fertilizer. Now we know the ratio, NPK, always keep you the order you will be used to saying NPK. So first calculate the mass of nitrogen, three of nine parts of your total mass. So it's three over nine times 12,5. So 4,17 kilograms is the mass of the nitrogen in the bag. We do the same for the mass of phosphorus, one of nine parts times 12,5 kilograms gives you 1,38 kilograms of phosphorus. 
and the mass of potassium is 5 of 9 parts. 5 of 9 parts times 12,5. So that's 6,94 6, kilograms of potassium. So if we add these up, we should get 12,5 or close to it because we have been doing some rounding off with our final masses. Eutrophication. This is the definition that you must know very well. The following that I have up is from the guidelines. Eutrophication is the process by which an ecosystem, if for example a river or dam, becomes enriched with inorganic plant nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, resulting in an excessive plant or algae growth. As the plant growth becomes excessive, the amount of dead and decaying plant material increases rapidly. So what happens is the overabundance of these nutrients will lead to rapid growth of algae. This algae covers the surface of water and then it blocks out the sunlight. The dead algae will sink to the bottom of the lake or the dam and it will deplete the oxygen supplies as they rot. So fish and other plants will die off and this will leave an ugly stinking mess. So you must know the meaning and the definition of eutrophication. It is all due to overfertilization. You have to know the following reactions for the production of fertilizers very well. Firstly, ammonia, not ammonium, ammonia reacts with nitric acid to form ammonium nitrate. This is an important fertilizer, very rich in nitrogen. Secondly, ammonia reacts with sulfuric acid to form ammonium sulfate. And then thirdly, ammonia reacts with phosphoric acid to form ammonium phosphate. Now, you need to know how ammonia is made in the harbour process, how nitric acid is made in the Oswald process, and how sulfuric acid is made in the contact process. I will go through those three processes very well after discussing this note. And then just a few points which also come up in your exams. Nitrates and ammonium salts are very soluble, which makes them ideal as fertilisers. These fertilizers can be dissolved in the irrigation water and the exact amount can be added to the irrigation water. So there won't be any over fertilization or any waste. And then thirdly, these fertilizers all have a very high nitrogen content. And remember nitrogen is very important for strong stems and leaves. Now we're going to look at the production of ammonia, nitric acid and sulfuric acid. I have made this summary of all three the industrial processes, the Harbour process or the Harbour-Bosch process for the manufacturing of ammonia, the Oswald process for the manufacturing of nitric acid and the contact process for the manufacturing of sulfuric acid. For each process you need to know the reactions, you need to know the constraints and you need to know what the temperature and the catalyst is. So in the harbour process, nitrogen gas reacts with hydrogen gas to form ammonia. It is a reversible reaction and it is exothermic to the right. Nitrogen is obtained from the fractional distillation of liquid air. You have to know that. And hydrogen is obtained from reacting coal with steam. That is called gasification and they do that at Sassel. Here's the reaction. It is an endothermic reaction. So coal reacts with steam, so it's very hot, lots of heat energy. Fractional distillation means they make use of different boiling points to boil off the nitrogen and the oxygen from liquid air. So it's a reversible reaction, nitrogen plus hydrogen forms ammonia. It is exothermic to the right. So the forward reaction will be favoured by low temperature. If you re remember that and think back to Le Chatelier's principle, an exothermic reaction is favoured by low temperature. The constraint there is, I've got special conditions at the bottom, the reaction is exothermic to the right, so the forward reaction will be favoured by cooling. At low temperatures, the rates of reactions are too slow and it takes too long for a system to reach equilibrium. In industry, time is money. You do not want to take long for your reaction to reach equilibrium. You do not want your particles to have low kinetic energy. So they chose a temperature of 450 degrees Celsius or between 400 and 500 degrees Celsius for this reaction to take place. 
The catalyst for this reaction is iron or iron oxides and the pressure is a 300 atmospheric pressure. That is a fairly high pressure. The reason for that is we have four volumes of gas on the left, two volumes of gas on the right. According to Le Chatelier's principle, if you want to force a reaction in the direction of the smaller number of gas volumes from four volumes to two volumes, you would apply a high pressure. So the shift in the direction of the smaller number of volumes would be to try and relieve this high pressure that you have applied. Hence the 300 atmospheric pressure. The constraint here, the special condition, the pressure, four volumes of reactants to two volumes of product. Therefore a high pressure favors the forward reaction. The constraint here is you need very strong reaction vessels and that is expensive. So a pressure of 300 atmospheres is applied to this reaction. You need to know everything in this green column. Now we go on to the Ostwald process, which is the manufacturing of nitric acid. In this process, there are three reactions that you need to know, three steps. The first step is ammonia reacts with oxygen gas to form nitrous oxide and water. It's also a reversible reaction. It is also exothermic. This reaction has a special name, catalytic oxidation of ammonia. Catalytic because this is where the catalyst comes in. The catalyst is platinum. And oxidation of ammonia means that ammo nitrogen's oxidation number will increase. But just remember ammonia is reacting with oxygen, so it is oxidation. It is also exothermic to the right. In the second step, this nitrous oxide is reacted with more oxygen to form NO2. You have to balance this equation. Please take note of the balancing there. This NO2 is then reacted with water or steam and you form nitric acid, which is what we want, and more nitrous oxide, NO. The NO that forms in this third step is then recycled in the second step. So the first step is the important one, the catalytic oxidation of ammonia. The catalyst for this step is platinum and the temperature here is 800 degrees Celsius to 1000 degrees Celsius for this process. If that is very hot as you know, so obviously it will use a lot of electricity. Um, the balancing numbers for these four gases is 9 volumes on the left to 10 volumes on the right. So pressure change here or increase in pressure or decrease in pressure will not affect the reaction very much. Now we go on to the contact process which is the manufacturing of sulfuric acid. This consists of four steps. In the first step sulfur solid is burned in oxygen to form sulfur dioxide gas. In the second step, the sulfur dioxide gas reacts with oxygen gas to form sulfur trioxide. Please note this is a reversible reaction and it is exothermic to the right. In the third step, the sulfur trioxide is reacted with some sulfuric acid, approximately 98% pure, to form oleum or its other name is pyrosulfuric acid. The reason that sulfur trioxide is not just reacted with water is that it forms a fine mist. It's very acidic and it is very hard to collect. So the oleum then is reacted with some water and that forms two molecules of sulfuric acid. If we go back to the second step, the reversible reaction, this is the step that has the catalyst. The catalyst, here's your catalyst line, the catalyst is vanadium pentoxide, V2O5. That is in this step. It is called the contact process because these gases need to be in contact with the catalyst. So the, the reaction is three volumes of gas on the left, two volumes of gas on the right. The same as in the harbor process, a pressure increase will force this reaction to the right, which is what we want. But the same constraint as in the harbor process, for high pressure you would need very strong reaction vessels and that makes the process very expensive. 
This reaction is also exothermic to the right, so the same as the Haber process, it would be favoured, the forward reaction would be favoured by cooling or a low temperature. A low temperature forces an exothermic reaction, so a low temperature would force it to the right because it's exothermic to the right. But again, if it's, everything is too cool, it takes too long to reach equilibrium and the reaction will take place slowly. So again, a happy medium is, is used. The temperature again is between 400 and 500 degrees Celsius, so I've just put 450 degrees Celsius. Your pressure for this reaction is between 5 to 7 times atmospheres. I'm going to come back to this, the third and the fourth step. As I said before, if sulfur trioxide is reacted with water, we form a fine mist. I've written here under your special conditions. The sulfur trioxide gas is not dissolved in water because it forms a fine mist which is difficult to collect. It is dissolved in 98% sulfuric acid to form pyrosulfuric acid or oleum. To get this formula, you don't need to remember it. Remember, sulfur trioxide is reacted with sulfuric acid. So you've got two hydrogen atoms, H2, two sulfur atoms, S2, and seven oxygen atoms altogether, O7. So the formula for oleum is H2S2O7. And then when it is added to the water in the fourth and final step, you have four hydrogens, two sulfurs, and eight oxygens. So that's just two molecules of H2SO4. So just remember, temperature and pressure constraints are the same in this reaction as in the Haber process. Low temperature favours the forward exothermic reaction. Temperature cannot be too low, otherwise the reaction is too slow. A high pressure will favour the forward reaction, but if your pressure is too high, your reaction vessels are too expensive. So now that we have looked at the processes for the Haber process, the Ostwald process and the contact process, we go back to the sheet. The Haber process is used to manufacture the ammonia, the Oswald process is used to manufacture nitric acid and the contact process is used to manufacture the sulfuric acid. You do not need to know how phosphoric acid is made, just remember this reaction. Now these reactions with the uh, three columns, the reactions in the three columns that we have just looked at, they will all be asked normally be asked in the form of a flow diagram. So I will be doing some questions from past papers from this section because really if you know the section well you can get full marks for the section and as I said in the beginning it is quite a few marks, almost, um, 9 marks to 16 marks in a 150 mark paper. So it's not much to learn and um, you can do pretty well in these questions.